Um, on behalf of the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, uh, good evening and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater and to the National Archives. Um, a special welcome to our uh, friends on YouTube. Uh, we're telecasting uh, this program. It's an important uh, vehicle for outreach uh, for the National Archives. I'm Jim Gardner. Executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services here at the National, Ar National Archives. Tonight, we're presenting um, a program drawing on the law of the land, a grand tour of our, of our constitutional republic, including a discussion on Lincoln's constitutional vision. We'll have a book signing for the law of the land um, uh, afterwards. But before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to mention two important programs coming up shortly in this theater. On Monday, June 15th uh, at 7 p.m. on Magna Carta Day, um, in celebration of the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta, we'll have a program on Magna Carta and the Constitution. Judge Royce Lambert, senior United States District Judge for the District of Columbia will moderate a discussion on the influence of Magna Carta on American constitutionalism, including its place in the charters of the American colonies, its impact on the era of the Founding Fathers, and its continued influence today. Panelists will include Professors Jennifer Paxton, uh, Louis Fisher, and Bruce O'Brien. Uh, a rare copy of Magna Carta uh, is on exhibit upstairs in the David M. Rubenstein Gallery. Then on Friday, June 19th at 6 p.m., we'll have the 2015 AFI Docs Guggenheim Symposium. The symposium pays tribute to filmmakers who have mastered documentary filmmaking and inspired um, and inspire audiences with exploration of the human experience. This program will be presented by the AFI Docs Documentary Film Festival in partnership with the Charles Guggenheim Center for Documentary Film here at the National Archives. To find out more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, please consult our monthly calendar of events. Copies are available in the lobby, along with a sign-up sheet so you can receive the calendar by mail or email, or you may visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the National Archives, especially its exhibits, education activities, and public programs uh, just like this one tonight. Uh, applications for membership may be found in the lobby, and as archivist David Ferriero likes to share, no one has ever been turned down for membership. But back to tonight's program. A discussion of the law of the land, a grand tour of our constitutional republic. I hope you all know that the National Archives is home to the U.S. Constitution. It's one of the core documents that reside in the rotunda above us. The Constitution, along with the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, collectively constitute the Charters of Freedom the documents that have guaranteed the rights and freedoms of Americans today. Even, even, as it's, even as the meaning of these documents has evolved over time, the subject of tonight's program. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Akhil Reed Amar, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale, University, and Doug Kendall, founder and president of the Constitutional Accountability Center. Thank you, Jim, so much for that introduction. And thanks to the archives for holding this 
event tonight, and um, thanks for all of you in the audience who struggled through uh, what seemed like a pretty rough little storm on the way in. I, I'm, I'm, uh, your dedication is noted in getting here, and, uh, and I very much appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in on YouTube. Um, I am just thrilled and delighted to be here uh, and to lead this conversation with Akhil Lamar, who's both a great friend uh, and a mentor to me and to discuss his wonderful new book called The Law of the Land, A Grand Tour of Our Constitution Repu Constitutional Republic. Um, as Jim mentioned, Akhil is the Sterling Professor of Law and Politics at Yale Law School. He is also, in my estimation at least, our nation's greatest constitutional scholar. Um, his book, um, which I also happen to have here, America's Constitution, a biography uh, is, among other things, the base upon which my organization, Constitutional Accountability Center, has been built. Um, it has been hailed by scholars and reviewers across the political spectrum, with one uh, very prominent conservative scholar calling it the greatest book written about the Constitution since the Federalist Papers. Uh, which I think is, is a great compliment, but also arguably true. Uh, and um, so uh, the first question I'm going to ask is really tied from that book to the book that we're talking about tonight. And, and America's Constitution a Biography is a opening to closing account of the original meaning of the Constitution. It is certainly the best count of our original meaning of the whole Constitution as written today that we have in existence. It has been enormously influential in getting scholars across the political spectrum to take serious arguments about the original meaning of the Constitution and the whole Constitution. And so it goes literally from we the people, the opening passage of the Constitution, through the 20th, 27th Amendment and everything in between in a very ordered, chronological fashion. The new book um, starts in the middle of that story. It starts with Illinois, which is in the middle of the country, with President Abraham Lincoln, who is one of our middle presidents. And it starts with the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, so in the middle of our Constitution. And so I guess my first question for you, Keel, is why? Why start the new book there? And thank you all for being here, Doug. It's such an honor uh, to be here with you in particular because I'm such an admirer of the Constitution Accountability Center, which is a national treasure, as is the National Archives. Um, and it's always an honor to be here. So um, uh, I was inspired to think about the Constitution as a, when I came here as a, as a young boy. I'll, um, I'll sh do some more with that later. But, um, and on the 100th anniversary of Reconstruction, which is the middle of the story, uh, I came here as a 10-year-old and I got a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, um, and we heard about these charters of liberty, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. But I want us to think about these other important charters of liberty generated by Lincoln and his generation, the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. Um, we live in Lincoln's house, you and I, as fellow Americans. The, <coughs> the framing was amazing. Um, and we don't want to take away from its grandeur and greatness. Um, a con uh, they put a proposal, they, they being the framers, uh, uh, to an, an entire continent about how, how they and their posterity would be governed. N nothing like that had ever happened in the world. So that's, that's amazing. But for all its greatness, it was a slaveholding society. Um, there wasn't really a serious conversation about the political rights of women. Um, the Constitution doesn't establish an idea that we're, um, the Constitution, mind you, that we're all created equal, um, black and white, um, male and female, Jew and Gentile. I would say gay and straight. Um, 
those ideas, those grand ideas, really are the ideas of, of Lincoln's generation. We live in his house, because the framer's house, great as it was, was proverbially divided against itself. Uh, it was a house divided against itself because of slavery, and it fell. We call that the Civil War, and in uh, the ashes of that massive destruction, the house was, was rebuilt. What we call the Bill of Rights, you know, which you heard um, celebrated by, by Jim as we, we walked in. Actually, almost n uh, there's almost no case that springs to your mind as a Bill of Rights case that's really a Bill of Rights case. Because the Bill of Rights originally applies only against the federal government. Congress shall make no law of a certain sort. Um, the Tenth Amendment um, uh, um, is about state rights. The entire Bill of Rights applies only against the federal government. And yet, the cases that we call Bill of Rights cases, well, they're cases about states and localities misbehaving. Brown versus Board of Education is Topeka, Kansas. And Mapp versus Ohio is a state. And Lawrence versus Texas is a state. And Bowers versus Hardwick is Georgia. And Gideon versus Wainwright is Florida. And New York Times versus Sullivan is about a repressive Alabama law, state law. What we call the Bill of Rights isn't really the Bill of Rights. It's the 14th Amendment. It's Lincoln's Amendment, along with the 13th and the 15th. We um, live in um, his house. This is the big idea of a new project that maybe we'll talk about, I hope, before we finish, uh, that the Constitution Accountability Center is featuring um, a second founding, a, a new birth of freedom, um, uh, to borrow um, uh, a phrase. Um, uh, you were kind enough to say some very nice things. My mother might have even believed them about uh, um, um, this, this book on America's Constitution. And it has this preposterous first chapter title, very unpretentious, In the Beginning. Um, and I begin with the beginning of the text and the beginning what I think of the modern world because before the Constitution, there's not very much democracy in the world and now there's a lot. And, and the first sentence, it started with a bang. And I want you to thank the Big Bang because this, it, so, so I, I told the story that one way, starting with the beginning of the text, working our way forward, the beginning of the constitutional project. But there are different ways of telling a story. Um, the world never really begins anew. There's always the back story. Episode four, A New Hope. Uh, and I believe that that way of telling the story um, uh, in this new book, Yes, starting with the middle of the country um, and a different generation, four score and seven years um, after uh, Thomas Jefferson, is illuminating because that was so transformative an experience. And there are different even ways of, of experience a book. We, uh, in our tradition, actually read from um, left to right and from the first page. In a scroll, actually, you see you open it up, and actually the middle is the beginning of, of, of the scroll. And it actually works out in very different ways. It's actually a whole different way of reading. Here's what I claim. That just as people in a Christian tradition, for example, read the Old Testament through the prism of this, um, uh, these later texts and this rabbi, called Jesus, who, who reinterprets these older texts. You, if you're a Christian, you read the book of Isaiah through the prism of the Gospels, you know, as if it says, a virgin shall give birth rather than a young woman shall give birth. So too, we Americans actually, every, we read everything at the founding through the prism of Lincoln's generation. And so I, um, all honor to, to the founders, but also all honor to Lincoln. And I'll just give a, a third way you can possibly read America's Constitution, which is really the way I most frequently do as somebody who takes his Akil's ideas and puts them in Supreme Court briefs and puts them out there you know, for a broader public dissemination. He actually has this wonderful annotated Constitution at the end of the book, which has a link in every provision to the pages in the book where it's discussed. So if you have a case on you know, an obscure provision of the Eighth Amendment, you go and you look at that and you say, oh, here's where I have to read. And so you can start anywhere. Uh, and it's still, uh, you know, you have to read it once through and through. But then just going back to, to using it as a lawyer is something, as you can see from the dog-earedness of my copy, that you, I do all the time. Um, just drilling down a little bit more, Akil, into um, 
the 13th Amendment, which is coming at the end of <coughs> this year, December uh, of 2015. It's the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the 13th Amendment, um, which I think most people know ended slavery in this country. One of our most important and transformational uh, amendments, I think Lincoln called it at one point a king's cure mm -hmm. for the evils of slavery. Mm -hmm. And as anyone who's seen the movie, wonderful movie, uh, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln played an extraordinarily important role, at least in its passage uh, through Congress. Um, now, he was dead by the time it was ratified, sadly and tragically. Um, but he did, in the congressional, uh, a congressional copy of the amendment as it's passed, sign it, which is something no other president, as far as I know, had done to an amendment. Um, and I, I just wanted you to talk a little bit more, Akhil, about, you know, you call uh, President Lincoln a one of, if not our most important constitutional mm -hmm. lawyers, mm -hmm. yet he doesn't have a formal role in the amendment process. Mm -hmm. um, how is that possible? How did he become this transformational constitutional figure in American history? Uh, so uh, the, most, uh, I, uh, the most important constitutional decisions in America haven't been made by courts. Um, um, my students know that I say that Marbury versus Madison is not only not the most important constitutional decision of all time, it's not even the most important constitutional decision of 1803. <laughs> and the most important constitutional decision of 1803 is the Louisiana Purchase because it's going to give us you know, a third, uh, uh, middle third of the country and portend the, the final third of the country. And, and Marbury versus Madison, the only, apart from my students, several of whom I see here, thank you for coming. Apart from them, there are only six of you who actually know what Marbury is really all about, other than judicial review, which actually was established well before Marbury. Um, but the, what's the issue in the case? It's about original versus appellate jurisdiction, and who cares? Um, of this, and... Louisiana Purchase guarantees that we're actually going to survive as a nation, and we're going to be able to beat the British the next time around, because there's probably going to be a next time around, and, and this city burns to the ground when there is a next time around, but, but we have a lot of, of place to, to fall back to. So even if you're judge-centered, in the Constitution, presidents pick judges, not the other way around, but see Bush versus Gore. See, that's the problem with Bush versus Gore, is it was the other way around. The most important constitutional decisions of all time were made by Abraham Lincoln. The decision to resist unilateral secession by force of arms, and that was a, he made it alone as president. And the chief justice at the time would have actually probably disagreed with him, Roger Taney, but it wasn't Taney's call; it was Lincoln's. He signed this Emancipation Proclamation, which is going to lead eventually to blacks bearing arms and the Union Army, Army prevailing, and his being reelected on an anti-slavery platform in 1864. He runs on this, and we endorse in 1864, we the people, an anti-slavery platform. In 1860, the platform is just, read our lips, no new slavery in the territories. But in 1864, the Republican Party says, we will get rid of slavery root and branch everywhere. If you like that, vote for us. If you don't, vote for the other guys. And Americans voted for him and his party. So formally, he's not playing a role, but the American people are endorsing that, and then he can twist some arms and sweet talk and cajole in that movie. That's after the election when he's actually won a ringing mandate. And so that, so the two biggest decisions are resist unilateral in constitutional decisions in all of American history: decision to resist unilateral secession, decision to uh, issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which will lead to the thirteenth his reelection, the Union victory, which will lead to the thirteenth amendment, which will lead to the fourteenth which we haven't talked about yet, which will lead to the 15th. And that transforms everything. It makes the Bill of Rights applicable to the states. It promises that we're all in the Constitution now. We're all born equal. We're all created equal. Blacks even are going to get equal rights to vote. In the 15th Amendment, who would you be without Abraham Lincoln? Would you be? It's like asking, like, who would I be if my parents had never met? Well, I wouldn't. And, and there would be perhaps no such thing as America, but for these decisions, they're so much more important than any judge um, ever made. Um, and, uh, and so just to repeat, we live in his house. Proverbially, he's our daddy. He's a founding father, every bit you know, as, as significant as 
um, uh, uh, Washingtons. And we're giving the founding generation, a lot of times, credit for things that Lincoln's generation really did. He signs it. You're absolutely right. And he doesn't have to. It's, it's, it's informal. But he pushes it through. Um, and, the for, and, and he is, in my view, the Moses of our people. It is given to him to, as it were, see the promised land. He does sign the 13th Amendment when it was proposed by Congress before his death. Um, but he doesn't actually get to inhabit it. He's, he's assassinated um, in a political assassination um, by someone who didn't like Abraham Lincoln's views about race relations and, and other things. Um, and uh, so, um, yes, there, there are different ways of telling the story. I told it the chronological way the first time around. But, but this time, if I'm going to tell um, it from a different point of view, from a geographic point of view, I'll say one more thing. Lincoln is profoundly influenced in making these decisions by where he comes from. It's not the East Coast states that, join, that, that generated the Constitution. It's the Midwestern states that are the backbone of the Republican Party and the Union Army. Um, Ulysses S. Grant and John Bingham and, and, and William Tecumseh Sherman from um, Ohio. And, and Grant also has Illinois connections. And Lincoln from Ohio. If you're in the middle of the country, Two or three important things. One, you believe that the country, you, you have to get your goods to market. And so you actually believe in railroads. And Lincoln's going to unify us east to west with the Transcontinental Railroad, as well as north to south. And Dwight Eisenhower from the Midwest is going to do the same thing with, with uh, interstate highways. Um, and you believe, if you're from the Midwest, there's no defensible border between the land of corn and the land of cotton. You can't let the South secede and build up a huge army on your southern flank because there's no Great Wall of China. There's no Alps separating North and South. All the goods, everything between the Appalachians and the Rockies drains through one mighty river basin, the father of waters, the Mississippi River. You can't let the South um, have an, uh, an economic stranglehold, a chokehold over the commerce for that entire region, which they could if they captured New Orleans and it fell into the hands of a foreign power. How are you going to get your goods to market? Your entire way of life depends on that. So there, he makes commercial arguments and military arguments, geostrategic arguments. If you're Lincoln, you actually believe that the Union created the states. This is a very weird idea if you're from Virginia. If you're Robert E. Lee, what are you talking about? The Lees have been running Virginia from the 1620s on. Virginia created the Union. But if you're Abraham Lincoln, first of all, you're not a state guy. You were born in Kentucky. Your father's from Virginia. Your grandfather's from uh, Pennsylvania. Before that, you think it's from New England, although you're not sure and you don't even know which state in New England. And then you move as a young boy to Indiana. And Indiana is not a state when you're moving in. It's just a territory. You're an American, but you're not a state person. And then you go to Illinois. And these states were created out of nothing, out of the wilderness, ex nihilo, by the federal government with good land grants and public education, which he believes in, the Moral Public Education Act. Um, so you believe that the union created these new states? Oh, and these states, these new states, they're free soil. The Northwest Ordinance is older than the Constitution itself. And it says, slavery nor involuntary servitude shall not exist. Why am I giving you that language? Because that's word for word the 13th Amendment that Lincoln you know, just volunteers to sign, saying, I I'm, I'm, I'm on board with this. The 13th Amendment, Lincoln's Amendment, is from the Northwest Ordinance, which um, um, reflects Lincoln's vision that there are deep union ideas, like, like federal territory even before the United States Constitution is ratified. It's a very Midwestern view of the world. So I want to switch gears now and move to Alabama, which is one of the chapters uh, in the, the law of the land. Um, and one of the more interesting ones discussing the legacy of Hugo Black, one of, as Akil explains, our greatest Supreme Court justice. I think um, when you, when at least Yankees like myself think of Alabama, we think of the heart of where Jim Crow was focused. We think of right now a state that's probably resisting the hardest the concept of marriage equality. Um, and yet, as you explain in the book, Akil, Alabama has also given us this giant among constitutional scholars, Hugo Black, and and really. Uh, um, a profit for your scholarship and the work of 
Constitutional Accountability Center. And I guess maybe it makes sense that Illinois created Lincoln. How does it make sense that Alabama created Hugo Black? Because Hugo Black shared a love of the Constitution. He actually, kind of the same, almost instinctive, this, this, this boyhood idea that I had when it came to the National I mean, to the um, National Archives, and, and this was almost like American scripture for him, and he read it. He comes from a, a part of the country that's the Bible Belt, and, and they take their, um, their scripture seriously down there. Um, so does Justice Thomas. Uh, so it's just not an ideological thing, same um, uh, from the Southland. Um, and Hugo Black was a former Klansman um, uh, 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 as a senator, because um, that's how you have to get elected and reelected re um, in Alabama. But now he's on the court, and he has life tenure, and he can do the right thing as he sees it. Um, uh, and, his, um, and he sees that the South is not, his South is not actually living up to the promises that were made by Lincoln's generation. Um, and you live in a world in which the Southlands has actually been brought into the Union. And Atlanta is this great world-class city and it hosts the Olympics. And that South is not possible unless it actually rejoins the Union on Lincoln's terms. Um, and Hugo Black actually understands <coughs> all of that. It, <coughs> this is not abstract for him. Um, if you're from the South, actually history is very real and vivid. You lost a war. People lose wars. They remember them maybe better than those who who won them, and Faulkner very famously says, you know, in Requiem for a Nun, that uh, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. Um, it's, it's a very vivid and, and real present. And so here's what the world looks like before Hugo Lafayette Black um, uh, joins the court as FDR's first appointee. Um, and it's unrecognizable. Because uh, uh, we call it the Warren Court, but it's really, uh, or maybe the Brennan Court, but it's really the Black Court. Because Hugo Black is going to give you, he's going to define the agenda that will become the Warren Court, which is, one, bringing our country into alignment with what this actually really promises, two, bringing the Southland into alignment with Lincoln's and the Northern and Western um, and Eastern vision. Here are the six things in 1936. This is what the world looks like. There's de jure segregation, apartheid, Jim Crow, uh, across much of the land. Uh, 40 states, uh, 45 states <clears throat> are malapportioned, maybe 40 grossly so. There's not one person, one vote. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is recitational prayer in the public schools, uh, sectarian, uh, where um, some sects are really given legal preference over others in, in, the, in public schools. The Bill of Rights does not apply against the states in judicial doctrine. It's not incorporated yet against the states. It only applies against the federal government. And, and again, to repeat, almost all the cases that you think of as Bill of Rights cases, they're actually involving states and localities. Criminal defendants have precious few constitutional rights, especially indigent defendants. There's no Gideon versus Wainwright yet. That's going to be a Hugo Black opinion in 1963, building on the dissent he writes in 1942 in Betts versus Brady. Um, and free speech, political expression, is not robustly protected by courts. Okay? That's the world of 1936. All these promises, because this really does say the right to vote. This really does say that the Bill of Rights is supposed to apply against the states. It really does say free speech and free exercise of, of religion. There really are rights of criminal defense in, in the, this document. Um, um, and it does say equal when it comes to race. And segregation ain't equal. It says these things. We're not doing these things. He's the original originalist um, from a me methodological point of view. And he's on the left, you see. So before there's Clarence Thomas, a great friend of mine, a great, I think, supporter of the Constitution. We sometimes disagree, but, but I so admire his vision of, of fidelity. He, he and I have this in common. We have Lincoln in common. Um, before there was Scalia, before there was Bork, who was my teacher, before there was Ed Meese, there was Hugo Lafayette Black, who methodologically took text and history seriously and tried to bring our practices into alignment with what Lincoln's generation really had promised. So that's one thing that he's doing. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and he, in the process of that, transforms American law um, and brings the Southland into alignment with the rest of the country's norms. That's great. So one of the points. Uh, 
you make in some detail, Akil, on the chapter on Justice uh, Jackson and New York is that the court with Justice Black and others, including Justice Jackson, used to have much more of a breadth, particularly of educational, geographic, and political experience, uh, and, and was diverse along those lines. Obviously, our court right now, as, as you explain, is very um, similar in terms of educational professional backgrounds. They're almost all, or they're all Yale or Harvard educated. They're all um, kind of professional lawyers. On the other hand, as you mentioned, Justice Thomas, uh, there are, is a very prominent conservative African American on the court. There's three women on the court for the first time. One of those women is the first Hispanics on, on the court. And so we have, in a way, a much more diverse court than we've ever had before. Yet we're also lacking in the uh, diversity of, of, of political and educational and, and other criteria. And I guess I, I'm struggling a little bit to how, how to balance how to think of the court right now and how to compare it to the Stone Court in the mid 20th century or, or the, or the uh, Warren Court mm -hmm. even 30 years ago. So there are many different ways of slicing things. Um, and uh, let me give you two or three. And I just want us just to think about more ways of slicing things. So um, here's one point. Um, there are different ways of approaching the Constitution and techniques of interpretation. There's the technique of text and original intent. There's also um, uh, practical consequences. There um, um, is what precedent has to say. Um, no one way, I think, is the only way um, to uh, think about constitutional interpretation. Constitutional interpretation, at its best, involves different tools and techniques. It may be that different backgrounds tend to generate justices who use different techniques. If, if you're a lower court judge for most of your life, what you do is doctrine. You follow Supreme Court precedent. You're really good at that. Um, but, and almost all, eight of the current nine justices were lower court judges, um, sitting federal appellate judges at the time of their appointment. And the ninth was Elena Kagan, who was Solicitor General of the United States, who did a lot of Supreme Court doctrine. That was her, her job. So you're really good at Supreme Court case law. But you may not have thought as much about text and history and, and structure of the Constitution. Um, and when you're on the Supreme Court, sometimes you're supposed to actually disregard case law because your fidelity is to the Constitution. And in 1936, I just told you what the case law said. It said no rights for blacks, no rights for criminal defendants, no strong, robust protection of political expression, um, Bill of Rights doesn't apply against the states, no one person, one vote, um, and uh, you can have organized prayer. That's what the precedent says. Um, but maybe this document says something different, and if you're just a lower court judge and you've just done precedent sort of all your life, maybe you're not going to be, um, uh, maybe we want a court that has different methodological perspectives and therefore maybe different um, backgrounds. Here's another way of slicing it. Um, we could slice it demographically, and we could talk about um, uh, the women's seats, or the African American seat or seats, or the Jewish seats. Um, uh, so, but we could also think about it geographically. Where do these folks come from? Because ours is a vast republic. We used to have a thing called the Southern. I just have to admit that um, there are other great places, um, and maybe we want sort of more perspectives. Um, uh, ideally, representing I'm just going to tell you just a couple of things. Geographically, the court used to be geographically oh, basically balanced. Why? Because the justices rode circuit. And the circuits were defined on lower courts geographically. And so you actually had to have justices genuinely coming from these different regions. Uh, and that's not true at, anymore. And, and that had its pathologies. The Dred Scott Court was profoundly imbalanced. Why? because it came from the circuits, and um, the South had more than its fair share of circuits. Five of the nine justices on the Supreme Court came from the Southland in 1857, even though it had only a third of the free population. Why? Because these justices had to basically travel from here to there, and the roads were off, and it was very swampy. So the circuits were smaller geographically, just because it was sort of hardship duty to actually cover the thing. So that meant 
The South had more circuits per capita than the North, so the South was actually overrepresented on the Supreme Court, and that was a problem in Dred Scott. So, but I just want you to even see that we've moved from geography to demography, because we got rid of circuit writing. We're, we're looking at it now um, in different ways. As for educational background, I, look, I'm you know, an Ivy League elite type, and, and so are all the justices today. I just would want us to remember that many of our greatest constitutional figures were not Ivy League elite types. And they tended to be underestimated sometimes by, because Abraham Lincoln had less than a year's formal education in his entire life. Not higher education, not college. Total, K through whatever, less than a year. Hugo Black basically didn't have a standard um, uh, uh, post-secondary education. He, he didn't have the standard four years of college. He didn't have the standard three years of law school. Robert Jackson went from high school. He did one year at a local law school and then apprenticed his way um, into being uh, a lawyer. And Robert Jackson is one of our greatest justices of the 20th century. And so is Hugo Black. And I told you that I think Lincoln is maybe our greatest constitutional figure, surely our greatest since the founding. Um, uh, the Warren Court, the court that gave you Brown versus the Board of Education, only one of them was a lower federal court judge um, before, uh, before joining the court. Only one. And you can't, and almost none of you, I'm sure, will even know that person's name if I told it to you. Anyone want to just shout out the name of the one lower federal court judge? If, and if you've read the book, that, that doesn't count. That's cheating. But if you haven't read the book, who's, um, or the uh, Atlantic piece, that, um, who's the one on the, on the Brown Court who uh, was a lower court judge? Earl Warren was not a lower court judge. He was governor, three-time governor of California, attorney general of the state, vice presidential um, nominee for president, but not a judge. Um, uh, Hugo Black was not a federal judge. He'd been a police judge at age 25. And Harry Blackman is going to be much later on. Frankfurter was not a judge, just a, a law professor. You have to be very careful about these people who are just law professors. Um, <laughs> Um, an Ivy League law professor type, just total pointy head, um, but not a lower court judge. Potter Stewart wasn't yet on the court. That's going to be a little later in our story. Uh, Douglas was uh, head of the SEC and a Sterling professor of law at, uh, at, at Yale University, and I think not a great judge. These Sterling professors don't always listen to what they say. You know, sometimes they're actually full of it, um, but not, not a, a, a federal judge. Sherman Minton. How many people even know the name Sherman Minton? OK. So, um, so, uh, so um, whereas today, and, and that gave, that's the court that gave you Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and they had, um, uh, Robert Jackson was an attorney general, um, and Hugo Black was a senator, and Earl Warren was a governor, and there were other um, and, uh, uh, SEC, and, uh, SEC chair and, and law professors. And, um, so it's possible, my claim is, given that there are different tools and techniques of constitutional interpretation, and given that what lower federal court judges excel at is just the Supreme Court tests, the doctrine, the formula, we want to have some of those on the court, but I don't know if we want to have nine doctrine people as opposed to folks who also have studied the text and history and structure of the Constitution, who have maybe actually watched laws being passed, who have advised presidents up close about how pre and understand how presidents actually make um, con important constitutional decisions. So it's just, a, this book is trying to get you to think about, um, to slice the story in a different way. This earlier one, and thank you for those kind words about it, was textual. It took you from the text from start to finish, from the preamble to Article 7, um, uh, and then all the amendments which are in textual, or, uh, which are in chronological order. That's one way to tell the story. But there are these different ways. And, and as I said, one is geographic. And the geographic way of, of, of telling the story, they all went to the, the, you know, two schools in New England, basically. And I'm a New England person. In a way, this is sort of, you know, I teach at these schools. It's good for me. But it's, there's just a question whether, that's, um, whether we might be missing something in the process. Well, so I'll, I'll continue and ask this question slightly different than I was going to because of your point about lower court judges following precedent and doctrine and tests. Yes. And I think perhaps one of the more important areas where the court really hasn't done that um, is in the area of marriage equality. We have under the Equal Protection Clause this elaborate doctrine of strict intermediate uh, rational basis scrutiny 
and Justice Kennedy, who has been leading um, the court in the direction of protecting GLBT rights and may issue an opinion uh, doing that in marriage equality later uh, in the term or later, this, later in the month of June, um, really has, has kind of passed on that and mm -hmm. just kind of said these are, under any standards, um, invalid constitutional laws. Um, and I guess as one of the themes, obviously, that the book brings out is the impact of geography on the court's decision making. And one of the assertions you make is that uh, Justice Kennedy's um, background and, and upbringing in California may affect the way he mm -hmm. looks at the cases like Obergefell, which is the marriage equality case that's coming out in June. And I just want you to say, talk a little bit about how so. So you were so sweet to ask why I'm starting at the begin in the middle with Lincoln. Here's another reason. He really, it, he, he's what we have in common as Americans. That's what I meant when I said he's our daddy. We live in, in his house. And at their best, both parties claim him. You know, One party is led today by a tall, skinny constitutional lawyer from Illinois, and the other party calls itself the party of Lincoln. Um, and, and if you go to Justice Thomas's chambers, one of his law clerks is kind enough to be here today. Nice to see you, Haley you will see Lincoln's portrait in his chambers. Uh, um, and so that's what we have in common at our best, I believe, Republican and Democrat, blue and red, liberal and conservative. Um, but truth be told, we don't have that many Lincoln Republicans in, um, today uh, um, in elective office. Um, we, America has, has never been divided big state against small state. The big states have nothing in common. California, Texas, Florida, um, uh, New York, not that much in common, the big states. Small states, um, Rhode Island, Delaware, Wyoming. America's divided, always has been, coast against the center and north against the south. The, the same states that voted for Lincoln in 1860, pretty much voted for Obama, tall, skinny constitutional lawyer, last two times around. The same states that basically voted against Lincoln, voted against Obama. It's the same basic division, except, amazingly, the parties have flipped. The Democrats have become the inheritors of Lincoln's geographic coalition, and the Republicans have become the party of the Confederacy, um, led in part by people like Rick Perry saying silly things about secession. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I revere Lincoln, and you can't say stuff about secession and be really true to Lincoln um, and, and his vision. We, we just have to get that straight, you know, because um, that, that was the most important constitution of decision ever, and Lincoln got it right. Um, okay, so now if all of that is true, and this is a geographic way of looking at it, here are some really interesting things about Tony Kennedy. He is a Lincoln Republican in some ways. He grows up in Northern California right down the road from me, and, and we have some things in common. Yeah, look, I don't want to overstate it because identical twins. I have twin girls. They actually disagree with each other about a lot of things, and, and no state is all red or all blue, and, and so you can grow up in a place, and, and Hugo Black disagrees with all sorts of other Alabamians. Okay, but in Northern California, we do get it on gay rights. Um, and um, I'm a Democrat, Tony Kennedy is a Republican, and I think we, but we grew up in the same milieu. Where did Tony Kennedy very concretely grow up? In Sacramento. Who's governor of California? Because Sacramento is the, the state capital when he's growing up. A man named Earl Warren, whom I invoked before, who's a genuine Lincoln Republican. There used to be such before there was this realignment that occurred in 1965 when the parties became very geographically um, uh, divided up. Tony Kennedy is part Ronald Reagan, Republican governor of California, who appoints him to the US Supreme Court. He's, but he's part Earl Warren, I think. Um, and um, he reflected openly about this at the oral argument at Obergefell, when he actually invoked two Earl Warren cases. He said, well, there was Brown, and then there was Loving versus Virginia, which is about miscegenation laws, um, marriage laws. And there was about a dozen years apart, and that's about as much time as, as we've been doing the same uh, gender equality. So he actually openly mused. He, 
he apparently is thinking about Earl Warren as he thinks about um, um, his role uh, on the court. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the one Republican appointee on the court who's most, I think, in his past decisions, um, sympathetic to the cause of gay equality in a case called Windsor, um, in a case called uh, Tex Lawrence versus Texas, in a case called uh, Romer versus Evans, all three pro-gay rights decisions, all three authored by Anthony Kennedy. I don't think it's a total coincidence that he comes from Northern California. That's like one thing. You need to understand lots about him, his, 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 his demographic characteristics, that he went to the Harvard Law School and, and before that Stanford, that he's um, of a certain a, a generation. Um, but he's from Northern California. He was influenced by Warren. And you see, what Warren did is not precedent. The precedent at the time was called Plessy versus Ferguson. You know, but Hugo Black had said, wait a minute, yeah, the precedent is Plessy versus Ferguson, but this really does say equal. And then I'll just bring it full circle. Four score. This is actually, I'm wearing my Lincoln tie in case you, <laughs> you and I bet they have copies of this in the bookstore here. I got this at the National of Constitution the Center. Of this tie. I oh, okay. uh, bet they do. They do have it in the bookstore at the National Constitution Center. And this is the text of the Gettysburg Address, you know, which is up there with those great um, icons um, uh, of liberty. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Well, Jefferson said that, but he didn't really live it and do it, slaveholder. Lincoln, the great rabbi, is reinterpreting those words at Gettysburg, breathing new life in them. And that reinterpretation, because and people understand Lincoln is talking about race um, in a, a way that um, and black people in a way that Thomas Jefferson, who lives and dies a slaveholder, I don't know what he was thinking about. Um, but Lincoln is, and his reinterpretation. How does he end? This nation must have a new birth of freedom, the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. New birth of freedom. All men are created equal. His interpretation of that is going to become, posthumously, because he, he, it's not given to him to see, the, to, to enter the promised land, only to glimpse it um, from a mountaintop. The first sentence of the 14th Amendment is a codification of it. Just like the 13th is bought based on the Northwest Ordinance from the Old Northwest, the first sentence of the 14th Amendment is a codification of Lincoln's reinterpretation of Jefferson. It says, everyone born in America is born a full citizen. I would say a full and equal citizen. We're all born equal. We're all created equal. Whether we were born to immigrant parents, my parents weren't even citizens when I'm born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. But I'm born a citizen on the day of my birth. And anyone here who was born in that hospital, you know, at that day or any other day in Ann Arbor, Michigan, you'd be a citizen too. We're all born equal. We're created equal. Now, what does that have to do with Brown versus Board of Education or Obergefell? I say, what does the birth equality idea mean? It's a, it's a radical idea. It's a great enlightenment idea that we should be judged not by the, uh, the, by the conditions, the status of our birth, but what we actually do in life, the content of our characters. And so it means at its core, we're born equal black and white, repudiating Dred Scott. That's the core idea. But if it had just been race, they could have said that, and they didn't. They say race, color, and previous condition of servitude in the 15th Amendment. They don't say that in the 14th. So it's broader than that. But it's anchored by race. You're born equal black or white. I would say we're born equal male and female. It was about sex discrimination. We already have an ERA. I'm for another one, but we already have one. It's called the 14th Amendment. I would say we're born equal, whether we're born Jew or Gentile. They would have thought of religion to some extent as ascriptive. They would have talked about the Hebrew race or the, uh, even the Irish race or, or something like that. And, and some people will say, I'm Catholic. I was born that way, even though they don't believe, or I'm Jewish, I, um, even though I don't believe. So, so they would have said black and white, the, they being Lincoln's generation, male or female, Jew or gentle, you're born equal whether you're born in wedlock or out of wedlock. The government shouldn't be discriminating against you because you were born illegitimate. The government shouldn't be discriminating against you because you were born third in your family rather than first. The firstborn shouldn't get, by law, more inheritance rights, no primogeniture and entail here. OK, I'm going to add one more thing. I happen to believe that we're born equal 
gay and straight. That, that, that sexual orientation is um, a, 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 a descriptive um, um, characteristic for many, not all, but for many. So now I've given you three reasons, I'm going to give you three reasons why that radical Lincoln vision, we have to start in the middle, you know, see, because we live in his house, has profound implications as mediated through um, Abraham, um, uh, Earl Warren and maybe um, um, uh, uh, Anthony Kennedy. Okay, one. If there's a, um, uh, a birth equality idea and people are born gay or straight, well, that they should have the same marriage rights um, as uh, gay folks as straight folks. Two, just male versus female. If um, um, uh, uh, um, a male can marry a certain woman, why can't a female marry that same woman? Because that's just a sex discrimination between the male and the female. Um, if Bruce Jenner decides to become Brianna Jenner, you see, um, why can't he be married to the same person? And actually, it, you know, if the operation were performed and he were married, that would be same-sex marriage because you're living in a world where men become women and women become men. The, found, the framers of the 14th Amendment might not have understood that, seen that, but that's our world. That's not science fiction. That's just science. Okay? So it's a sex discrimination. Um, which is a violation of the birth equality idea. It's a sexual orientation discrimination. I also think it's deeply identitarian. Even if it's chosen, it's deeply identitarian in the way that it's, ch it's chosen that I chose to be Christian. Right? I wasn't born that way. I chose to be. Um, or, um, and, and so it should be protected as religion should be protected as a basic life choice that's not harming others. So, and those, all of those are deep Lincolnian ideas, I submit, that if you take seriously that first sentence of the Gettysburg Address, his reinterpretation of Jefferson that gets codified in the first sentence of the 14th Amendment. Well, you can see these connections. And the 14th Amendment very pointedly, I'll just add one little thing, uses the word persons, not men. Um, and so all persons have equal protection in the law, which I think is just a profound change. And a perfection of the Declaration and gives, again, the founders of the 14th Amendment could have simply protected the African American, the freed slaves from discrimination. They didn't. They and, very and, and, broadly, they very deliberately chose to protect all persons. And I haven't done enough of a shout out since you asked me why I start in the middle. When we start in the middle, we also start not just with Lincoln, but with his generation, which includes Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who are much more prominent advocates of a much more f um, full-throated vision of gender equality than Abigail Adams, for example, was asking for in a private letter to, um, urging John Adams to remember the ladies. Abigail Adams is not asking, actually, for equal voting rights or equal even civil rights. She's basically just saying marriage law should not let husbands beat their wives. That's all. That's, that's the context of, of remembering the ladies. And, but when, but the, the language of the 14th Amendment actually tracks certain proposals made by Elizabeth Cady Stanton the months before. So we're bringing women into the conversation in a very big way. And Lincoln early on actually says, you know, actually I think women should, should even vote. He, you know, he doesn't say that as president, but, right. but um, it's a, we're bringing a very different set of generational sensibilities into the conversation when we start with Lincoln's generation. Well, Akhil, I have uh, a million more questions than I'm going to be able to ask if we're going to allow questions from the audience, which I want to get to in a few minutes. So, um, but I want to end kind of where we began. Um, Second founding? With the, uh, you know, with the efforts to implement um, President Lincoln's constitutional vision, which are a five-year effort from 1865 to 1870, where we passed the most, and rat, the, we the people ratified the most profound changes to our Constitution that have been made over the last 225 years. Um, the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, the 14th Amendment, which we've talked about extensively, guaranteeing equal, you know, birthright citizenship, equal protection, due process, and which is something we haven't talked about today, which is profoundly important privileges or immunities for United States citizens. Um, and then the 15th Amendment, which is the first of six separate amendments that expand the right to vote or the right that, mm -hmm. uh, of the 
the topics you, the citizens can vote on. It's been our most important and, and sustained um, effort at constitutional improvement. And I guess, so with the Keel um, Constitutional Accountability Center, the National Constitution Center, in an effort uh, being led by former Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, um, as national chair, are, are organizing and are trying to implement a five-year celebration of the what we're calling the Second Founding, these three amendments passed after the Civil War. Um, and I just would love mm -hmm. for you to comment on both why Second Founding is the right term for this, uh, rather than the Civil War amendments or the Reconstruction amendments, which these amendments are kind of more commonly caused. Called, and then also why a celebration like this is so important for the way we think about our Constitution. So um, the book, uh, the new one, The Law of the Land, uh, is launched um, on April 14th of this year. That's the 150th anniversary of the assassination of Lincoln. He, he dies the next day. Um, this, the, the 150th of the end of the of the Civil War, and I begin, as you, you mentioned, with Lincoln. Um, uh, we talk about the founders, and we talk about the framers. Those are architectural metaphors. They built something, and they built a house. Um, and the Reconstruction, that's actually an architectural metaphor, too, the, a rebuilding. I believe that that house w was on an uneven foundation because the nation was half slave and half free. When Lincoln says, a house divided against itself cannot stand, he's punning. There are at least two things he's, mean, he's referring to. We could think about a, a house as um, um, a family line, the, the house of Atreus, um, <coughs> um, <coughs> or the house of David uh, in the Old Testament. Um, or we could think about it as a building, and I think Lincoln wants us to understand it as both, but, but the foundation is fundamentally rotten. It's, it's not even because it's half slave and half free. And in the long run, a house built on an uneven foundation, this is just you know, some advice to my students here who haven't yet bought their first one. Check out that foundation, you know, because it's uh, when the rains come, and they will come, um, houses with good foundations um, last. So, um, so that's why second founding, actually, because we're talking about the most basic elements of society. And, and if you don't build on a proper foundation of the equality of all, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this nation, uh, uh, on this continent, a new nation conceived in liberty. And Lincoln believes it's dedicated to proposition. It actually has a, found, a proper foundation. We haven't done justice to in the Constitution that all men are created equal. So it is a second founding because we finally got that foundation right. And then we can, we can um, proceed to build. Um, uh, I do believe that um, what, and I give so much credit to the Constitution Accountability Center for wanting to remind us of the 150th anniversary of, of, of the, all these um, uh, events, um, of the 13th Amendment, the signing of it and then the ratification, and the 14th and the 15th. This book is launched on the uh, 150th anniversary, which is of Lincoln's death. And, and I was here before on the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And I um, waved this once again. Um, let me actually show you what's on the inside, because when I was here for the 150th of that, which is also the 225th anniversary <coughs> of the signing of the, of the um, uh, going public of the Constitution, Justice Thomas was sitting where you are, and, and he was kind enough to inscribe it, uh, this to me, to Professor Akhil Amar. Um, Thanks for all you do to preserve liberty. Warmly, Clarence Thomas. This is something that we all have in common. Okay, this is not a partisan thing. Um, conservatives believe in applying the Bill of Rights against the states. They think that's true for the Second Amendment as well, you see. Um, they believe in robust free speech. They think that actually might mean Citizens United. Um, um, they, um, I, and I'm not saying that mockingly. I defend Citizens United. You can have at me. I defend Citizens United in this, in this book because actually a free press is, is a significant, is a very important, and we can, we can talk about that. So, um, um, liberals and conservatives don't just have George Washington in common. Um, 
we have Abraham Lincoln. Indeed, I believe he's more of a unifying figure deep down because the Constitution that we, we all celebrate Brown. Brown was controversial at the time. But now everyone, the conservatives say, actually, Brown says we have to be a little worried about affirmative action because you know, the Constitution is supposed to be colorblind and you're not supposed to be judged by the color of your skin but the content of your character. But that's progress when we're all agreeing on this second founding, on the rightness of Brown, on the rightness of the application of the Bill of Rights against states, on the rightness of a right to vote. And, and people aren't openly defending malapportionments today. Um, sometimes they might try to do it on the sly, but no one openly says this is, this is the right and American thing to do. So second founding precisely because it's actually, I believe, what all the justices have in common, what both parties at their best have in common, what all Americans have in common, because we really do live in Lincoln's house. Well, that's great. Um, well, I think we're at the point where um, we can entertain questions from the audience uh, and would love to do so. Yeah, if you could please step to one of the microphones. There's one on each side. Uh, and if you could um, be kind of identifying yourself, uh, that would be helpful to us. And why don't we go for it? I'm Holly Joseph, just someone interested in gender equality. And I uh, would love to think that the 14th Amendment guaranteed gender equality, but I think that maybe it isn't as substantial as, as you think. I mean, I think why, so I'd just love for you to answer why Susan B. Anthony um, was arrested when she tried to vote well after the 14th Amendment, and why Alice Paul, after achieving the 19th suffrage under the 19th Amendment, thought that gender equality would not be documented until it was in, documented in our Constitution? Excellent. The great question. Um, so it turns out there's a lot of, <clears throat> of evidence um, about um, uh, uh, women's uh, centrality in the 14th Amendment conversation. Um, you could read a very short little piece I did. I, I think it's available uh, on the web called Women in the Constitution. I'm going to just read you some, some evidence um, uh, uh, about that. Um, um, and uh, um, so why then, and, and some of this, honestly, my friend Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't know, I think, when she was crusading for women's equality in, in the 70s. Because just the historians hadn't uncovered all this stuff um, um, for her to know. So one obvious question, well, Professor, why did you need the 19th Amendment then? For the same reason you needed the 15th. No one denies that the 14th Amendment was centrally about race discrimination. So why did you need the 15th Amendment? Here's why. Because the 14th Amendment was about equality in profound ways, but about only what they called civil rights. Now, today, we think civil rights mean voting. They didn't. They meant civil rights in contradistinction to political rights. Here were the political rights. Voting, office holding, jury service, military duty. Why would it make sense for them to distinguish between civil and political rights? Because there are two categories of citizens who have, what are civil rights? Everything else. Um, the right to speak freely, to have a printing press, to open up a business, to sue and be sued, to worship freely. Um, all the things that we call have a right in, uh, uh, to have a gun in your home for self-protection. All these basic rights, but not voting, office holding, um, jury service, and military service. Why would they think those are different? One, because I'm a Connecticut person. When I go to New York under Article 4 of the original Constitution, I'm entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens, which means they have to treat me like a New Yorker for every purpose. I get to own property in New York. I get to um, open up a business in New York, to worship in, in New York churches. Here are the four things I don't get to do as a Connecticut person in New York. Vote in a New York election, serve in a New York legislature or, off, or government more generally, serve in a New York jury or militia. Those are civil and not political. 
Now, when the 14th Amendment comes along and Doug invoked the phrase and uses the same word, citizens, privileges, and immunities, they're saying actually you have those same rights against the state, okay? but not political rights. That's why we need a 15th Amendment, because 15th Amendment is about voting rights. That's why we're going to need a 19th Amendment. Now, um, here's the second category of people that they're thinking about. They're called women, and they're clearly citizens. The 14th Amendment says very clearly, everyone born in America is a citizen. That means women. They can sue in diversity jurisdiction, unlike Mr. Dred Scott, who's not a citizen. Okay, So the, they're centrally thinking about women, but t civil rights are different from political rights. So the 14th Amendment is about civil rights for all women as well as men, blacks as well as rights, but it's not about voting rights, which is why you're going to need a 15th Amendment, why you're going to need a 19th Amendment, why Section 2 of the 14th Amendment is about voting rights and political rights, but not Section 1. Now, this is going to come as a surprise to almost everyone because they say, well, Professor, we were taught that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment is all about voting rights and one person, one vote, and all the rest. Not so much because they're actually using the word person as distinct from citizen. So there are voting rights in the Constitution, but actually the 14th Amendment, Section 1, historically is not what they are. Now, I'll give you some evidence for this. Okay. Um, here's the Republican Party platform of 1872. The Republican Party is mindful of its obligations to the loyal women of America for their noble devotion to the cause of freedom. Their admission to wider fields of usefulness is viewed with satisfaction, and the honest demand of any class of citizens for additional rights should be retreated with respectful consideration. That's the Republican Party platform of 1872. Here's Elizabeth Cady Stanton's proposed 14th Amendment, and it's word for word, in some ways, what actually becomes the 14th Amendment. Now, why are people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth K. Stanton disappointed? Because they wanted voting rights as well, and they're not going to get that until 19, uh, the, the, the 19th Amendment, just as it took a later amendment to give blacks voting rights, the 15th Amendment. The, again, 14th Amendment is about, 13th Amendment is about freedom, 14th, no slavery, 14th Amendment is about civil rights, 15th Amendment is about, and the 19th Amendment is about political rights. Here's Elizabeth K. Stanton's um, language. Um, um, the key language of Section 1, which is proposed in 1866 <laughs> by Congress, closely tracked the language of a... Dis I'm reading from my book on the Bill of Rights. <laughs> okay, this is the third book. book. So you got to make sure. That so he's written you a guys lot have them, a lot so, to read. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> The key language of Section 1 closely tracked the language of a December 1865, so before, essay by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, calling for an amendment in which, quote, the women as well as the men shall be secured in all the rights, privileges, and immunities of citizens. This essay, in turn, echoed Stanton's, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's, famous 1848 Seneca Falls Declaration, demanding for women, quote, all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States, unquote. Okay, finally, and this is my um, interpolation. Many women, though, were outraged by Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which we haven't talked about, which excluded women from the presumptive electorate and for the first time put the word male into the Constitution. But Section 2, which is about voting rights, casts no shadow on Section 1, which dealt with civil rights, not political rights, for more discussion, see. So, so um, and actually when I'm writing this stuff, this is pretty new historical material. My students had, I, I, I also quote um, here, Sandy Ryerson, Nina Morace, and others did uh, also some great work. So, so if you're interested, there's lots of very interesting history on this. So strictly speaking, the ERA, you know, Gandhi was once asked what he thought of Western civilization. And he paused and he said, I think it would be a good idea. Um, uh, now, uh, ERA, I think it would be a good idea. I actually believe we already have it. It's called the 14th Amendment, which could have said race, but didn't. But I'm for saying it again, once more, this time with feeling. Um, couldn't hurt, belt and suspenders. But we already have an ERA. It's called the 14th Amendment. And in fact, in Supreme Court case law, they treat gender discrimination as very problematic in Supreme Court case law. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been at the forefront of, of that. It just turns out there's more history supporting her than perhaps even she knows. Well, we go to that side. Uh, first of all, gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, I feel like an outsider because you gentlemen are from the East Coast. I did USC and Stanford. Sorry about that. I'm, fr I'm from Warren um, Creek, California. Uh, 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 so. uh, Welcome. Two quick questions. One, the Earl Warren Court and 
Brown versus Board of Education. Um, I had always heard that uh, the Chief Justice said it was going to be unanimous or nothing at all. And that way it would be believable. Is that true? And secondly, I would follow on to your point, sir, um, about the faith of the church. Now, I'm a Jewish kid from the suburbs, but I find it remarkable that our current Supreme Court is either all Catholic or Jewish, no Protestants, no Episcopalians. I've got friends visiting here from Utah tonight. Um, does that mean anything? Does it say anything? And should we take anything away from that? And again, thank you for your scholarship for both of you gentlemen. Thank you. Those are two great questions. Earl Warren, I believe the Warren Court um, is in effect a powerful alloy of, of, of three um, uh, folks who actually bring remarkable complementarities. Earl Warren is a Republican Western governor. Hugo Black is um, a Southern Democratic senator. And um, uh, Bill Brennan is a Northeastern um, Democrat um, state judge. So judge, senator, governor, um, West, South, Northeast, Southern Democrat, Northern Democrat, and those were two very different kind of Democrats in the 1950s, you know, and uh, Republican. So kind of very, um, I'm not a basketball um, a person um, uh, um, for maybe obvious reasons, but um, uh, um, uh, I am put in mind of these great basketball teams, and, and you can think of, of uh, um, Earl Warren as your, the forward, I mean, excuse me, the, the center. He's sort of in the middle. And, and Bill Brennan is the playmaking guard who's involved in everything. But the power forward, the guy who really actually makes that team is Hugo Black. He's the intellectual leader. But an intellectual leader, you know, you need five. And Brennan is very good at counting to five. But, but Earl Warren says, we're not counting to five here. We are counting to nine. Yes, and he does, and, and, and he's a Republican, and so is, is Burton, actually, and the others are Democrats. We are going to be unified. Um, and John Marshall very famously tried to, spoke for the court and unify. So, so um, in telling you that black is the intellectual architect of the Warren court, I don't mean to detract from Warren who, um, and Brennan who helped put together the coalitions, okay? but. Bill, uh, but, but Hugo Black is defining the intellectual agenda of what will be become the Warren Court even before Warren and Brennan arrive. In dissents in the 1940s and early 50s, he is saying one person, one vote, Cole Grove versus Green, applying the Bill of Rights against the states, Adamson versus California, uh, rights especially for indigent defendants to counsel, Betts versus Brady, which is going to become Gideon versus Wainwright, um, uh, equality in uh, religious equality in the school is a case called Everson. Um, uh, strong protection of free speech, a case called Bridges versus California, and many dissents in, in the communist cases. Um, and um, which one have I missed? Um, oh, on, on race equality, he's joining uh, racial equality decisions before Brown, and he's the one justice from the Deep South who's on board of Brown. He's the one justice who really takes a hit in his social circle, because Brown is um, unpopular in his part of the country. The Southern Manifesto is signed by every Southern um, senator, um, except, it's con Brown's controversial at the time in the, pop, in the broader public, except Al Gore Sr. from Tennessee, Lyndon Johnson from Texas, and Estes Scafava from Tennessee, the peripheral South, not the, the, the deep South. And so, this is hugely unpopular in Alabama. Um, and um, so, so black is the intellectual leader, the power forward, so, so to speak. Um, but yes, Warren deserves tremendous credit as, in effect, a politician keeping a coalition together, herding nine cats or scorpions, if you um, like um, uh, um, uh, Noah Feldman's uh, lovely image of nine scorpions in a bottle. On religion. I'll go you one better. It's an amazing insight. 
not only are, this is still a largely Protestant country, the Constitution was founded by mainstream Protestants. Not only are there no mainstream Protestants on the Supreme Court today, um, there's of the four guys who ran for president and vice president last time around, only one is a mainstream Protestant. His name is Barack Hussein Obama. Hussein, Obama, <laughs> Barack, okay. <laughs> Because Joe Biden's a Catholic and Paul Ryan's a Catholic and Mitt Romney, um, Mormonism didn't really exist as a, as a major religion um, uh, uh, in, at the founding. Uh, you know, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young are going to come kind of later in the story. Um, um, and um, Harry Reid um, is a Mormon and um, uh, um, John Boehner is a Catholic. And, uh, and uh, um, so, uh, and of the four guys up there on Mount Rushmore, two of whom I've invoked again and again and again today, two of them are not conventional churchgoers, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. Wow. We have lived out in America sociologically and not just narrowly legalistically this idea that there are not religious tests for government service, that, that our, our, our service is open to people of, of, of many faiths and eventually, you know, maybe even no faith. Neither um, Jefferson or Lincoln sort of publicly professed atheism at the time or was a, a heretic or a blasphemer, but they were, were, they were not orthodox, mainstream, um, uh, 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 mainline sort of Protestant churchgoers. Um, so I think it says something pretty extraordinary about our religious um, inclusiveness. We're maybe unique in, in, in the world, um, or at least if not unique, very special in our religious openness. And, and I think this is an implementation of this idea that we're all equal regardless of our religious affiliation. Um, and even if we choose our religion, which is why even if you believe that people choose their gender identity, it might be sort of very deep to their their own self-understanding, their, their um, understanding of their own place in, in the universe. Um, so it's not exactly race. It's not exactly sex. Um, um, it's not exactly religion, but it's similar to those. And, and all of those are very f uh, basic uh, um, 14th Amendment categories that, um, that our uh, courts sort of rightly um, uh, discourage government from sorting us out on the basis of. And if I can just take here a point of privilege as a, uh, what is called a double who, somebody who went to University of Virginia for, uh, for both undergraduate and law school and defend Jefferson for just a second. Uh, uh, not something I, I typically do, but he does list on his uh, tombstone one um, the drafting of the declaration, which I think he didn't live up to in his personal being, but has become the foundation of our country in the 14th Amendment. The uh, religious declar the Virginia Re Declaration of Religious Freedom, which he was a profoundly important force in both the understanding of religion and at the founding and the, the um, religious text in the Constitution, and then obviously the founding of the University of Virginia, which I, I think is certainly as unequivocal a good as, uh, as a man ever did. Uh, well, and so that's, uh, except, except that it was a uh, segregated school well, for <laughs> a long time. Public education is a, a, a Jefferson idea that Lincoln is going to build on. Link, uh, Jefferson gives us the first draft of the Northwest Ordinance, which has a commitment to sell public lands for public schools. Lincoln is going to turn that into the Moral Land Grant Act. See, um, um, so a very big believer in public e education, um, which is about giving everyone a chance, low-born as well as high-born, to achieve um, uh, great success. These, these very low-born people, because of, of edu you know, access to education, like Barack Obama, are, are, are able to... Um, so, um, so, yes, um, Jefferson does See, I knew if I got him credit. started, he could do a better job no, defending no, no. it than I could. So that's, uh, that was my, my point taken. Why don't we go to the side? 
Hi, good evening. Um, I very much enjoyed your presentation. However, there's another side and another way to look at these things. I mean, for example, just the Civil War, and I'll run through these quickly, but the Civil War, 600,000 people, um, you know, I'm not saying there was a better way to do it, but that was really disgusting. I can understand the feelings of the South. Okay, the 14th Amendment, giving personhood to the corporations. I mean, that, that, that's disgusting. Um, the, the Citizens United, the title itself is disgusting, but the fact of the matter is nobody's telling big money they can't say what they want to say. It's a question of whether or not you can dominate the elections. It's not whether or not you can speak, it's whether or not you can scream in somebody's face endlessly until you've propagandized their brain into thinking this is a democratic system. So it's things like that. We get carried away with ourselves and are rewriting a history. South Africa has had freedom of the sexual freedoms in their constitution, I believe. So it's a human thing that we're dealing with. And the United States just plays a part of this grander history and I think we have to start putting ourselves in perspective. Great. Those are four outstanding questions. Let me go through them in order. Or, and, and, and maybe not in order, but let me come. Um, so I am a proud American exceptionalist. Um, America is the indispensable nation in the world. Um, you know, I like uh, uh, Nelson Mandela as well as the next uh, fellow. He's one of my heroes. Um, and his hero is named Martin King. Um, who you know is channeling Abraham Lincoln and gives the march on Washington right over here on the hundredth anniversary you see of of some of these reconstruction um, uh, events. So there have been there are great nations in the world. There's none that's done anything remotely comparable to the United States. Before the United States Constitution, there's democracy almost nowhere in the planet, and has been there has been democracy almost nowhere in the planet for all of recorded history. The only democracies that exist tiny little Greek city states where people meet face to face. Um, in 1786, the only democracies going other than America are Britain, which has an established church and a hereditary House of Lords and a hereditary monarch, you know, that no one voted for, and um, um, and impossible property qualifications to be a member of the so-called House of Commons and Switzerland, which has but no we commerce. we were not a so, democracy. So, um, we were not a democracy in the beginning. Well, um, I believe we were but for slavery, and that's a very big um, but. Um, but all the ancient Greeks had democracy and slavery. Um, the word democracy is actually proudly borne by Thomas Jefferson, who calls himself alternatingly a Democrat, Republican. The word democracy means the same thing as actually republic, ruled by the demos, or the people. Lincoln himself actually says very clearly that the United States is a democracy, in, um, and so does uh, James Wilson, who signs both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So with respect, I, I know you were taught a bunch of things, I was taught those too, when you read my books, and you have to, because actually <laughs> the world depends on your actually knowing the facts, you're going to have to unlearn some stuff. We are a democracy, so there was no democracy self-government in the planet, practically, for all of recorded history, and there's not very much in 1786 when you look around the world, it's just the Swiss and the Brits, you know, it's not... Um, um, uh, there's an absolutist tyrant who, who sits on the throne um, in, in France, and, and, um, and um, there's no um, a democracy in um, my, what's now my parents, uh, uh, India. It's, it's ruled by Brits um, in, in, in Africa, in um, the rest of Europe. And now you see democracies over half the planet um, by land mass and population, and that is because of the military, political, economic social, cultural, and legal success of the United States Constitution. It's because in one year, the year that changed everything in human history, that's why I started the last one. In the beginning, it started with a bang. The modern world was created, but I said that before, and you can see that on YouTube. Here, in the United States, was, the world was made in America, your world, the modern, democratic, religiously plur pluralistic, tolerant, free speech world, that was made in America, okay? So I just, um, and that's why the last book began... In the beginning, it started with a bang. We, the people of the United States, up and down a freaking continent for a whole year, we debated this short thing so every farmer could read it and decide whether he was for it or against it. And for a whole year, we actually 
debated how we and our posterity across the continent were to be governed, and you could be for the thing or against it, and no one tossed you off the island. Um, massive free speech. Um, and in, in many, many places, more people got to vote than it ever got to vote for anything before in human history. In New York, for example, every adult free male citizen gets to vote. No religious qualifications, no property qualifications, no racial qualifications, no literacy tests. It's pretty amazing. Um, no religious tests, did I say that? Okay. So, um, that's one. I, I, so, um, um, 600,000 dead. No one knew that at the time. Um, that it was going to be that, you know, this is a problem often with wars, you think they're going to end easier than they do, but whose fault is that? And I put the fault squarely on traitors um, in the South who took up arms against a duly elected government. In 1776, we, the people of the United States, took up arms against a king that no one had voted for and a parliament that no one had voted for that were imposing all sorts of rules on Americans absent their consent. And we came up with a bunch of reasons he submitted facts to a candid world. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another, you know, a decent respect for the opinion of mankind suggests you know, that they should give their reasons. We gave a whole bunch of reasons because they were doing all sorts of things to us without our consent. None of them. They weren't able to come up with a set of reasons. The South was in uh, 1860, and the reason, frankly, was slavery. That's what they were, were, were fighting for. And when you read actually what they say, it's really on the surface. And here's what Lincoln says. He says, we've just had an election. If you don't like it, you have to wait four years and vote again. Okay, because all the democratic projects in the world have basically failed in Europe in the 1840s. We are the only real democratic project going. We are the last best hope of Earth. We are the place, if, we, if, we, if democracy doesn't work here, we, the world isn't going to take it seriously. We have to make it work here, because we are the one democratic experiment in the world, and you can't have democracy. If people who lose an election fair and square take up arms against the government, you, can, you know, bullets can never trump ballots. That's why Lincoln says at Gettysburg, what is at stake is nothing less than whether government of the people, by the people, for the people shall perish from the earth. He understands that that's what's at stake. And if it takes 600,000, we have to stay the course because you can't have democracy, you can't fa have fair elections when people who lose elections don't abide by, by their results. Um, on finally, corporations and Citizens United and how corporations are dominating the discourse. I said you weren't going to like what I had to say, but I'll say it anyway. I do defend. Um, uh, Justice Kennedy in Citizens United and the conservatives on the court and Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia and Justice Alito and here's why I do. Because Random House is a corporation um, and I don't want the government to be able to shut that down because I want you to actually have, you know, get my Random House book. <laughs> um, and the New York Times and Basic Books is a corporation and Yale University is a corporation um, and many churches are corporations. Um, and the New York Times is a corporation. And here's what they can't do. They don't get to vote on election day. One person, one vote, secret ballot, that's a great campaign finance reform. These corporations can have effects only if ordinary people actually pay attention to them and vote that way, but no one's forcing them to do that. The best campaign finance reform is actually an educated citizenry. Mitt Romney had more money, I voted against him, he lost. Meg Ryan had more money, you know, friends of mine in California voted against her, she lost to Jerry Brown. Uh, this woman ran twice in Connecticut, um, Linda McMahon, she's this worldwide wrestling person. The more ads she ran, the more money she spent, the less I liked her, I voted against her twice. And I thought, is this a great country or what? She's pumping money into our economy and I get to vote against her. Um, that's, um, so, here's what we have to restrict campaign contributions, because that may be corrupt, that's money in politicians' pockets. I'm not defending an unlimited right to do that. But telling, writing an op-ed or publishing an, a, um, a book or an article or a magazine or running an, um, an, an ad that says, vote for Hillary or vote against Hillary, gee, that's core political expression um, as um, I see it. Now, I can give you all sorts of ideas for what real campaign finance reform would be because I think we, we need real campaign finance reform to make a final point. Even if you could shut down the corporations, there are rich individuals, you know, um, and their names are Coke or Soros 
Um, or, uh, and again, by, by the way, if you can shut down um, ads, then the game becomes owning the media rather than renting it. And then you, know, you, you own CNN, and your name is Ted Turner or William Randolph Hearst or whatever. So we have to have serious campaign finance reform. McCain-Feingold was not it. It was actually incumbent self-protection. I'm with the conservatives on the court on that one. Uh, so we can take oh, I, one we're, last we're quick we're question, and I'll do so. We're, we're at about our time, so I'm going to ask both the questioner and, and Professor Marr to be uh, relatively brief, and then we'll close this up. Hi there. Um, so putting the insular cases aside for a second, do you have an opinion on the political rights of the citizens of the insular territories? Um, I haven't. Um, so I've very rudely mention all these books that I've written because I want you to, you don't have to buy them. Um, they're libraries, information wants to be free, but I want you to read them. Because uh, some of the stuff that we were taught, that I was taught, you know, it's big state, small state in the Electoral College. No, the states aren't divided big state versus small state. It's, it's north against south and coast against the center. It's not a democracy, professor, it's a republic. There's no difference between them and no founder except James Madison, one Federalist paper that no one read, really actually said so. Federalist paper, you all read, but it wasn't read at the time. It's called Federalist 10. You say, what are you talking about? 10 is not important. It actually wasn't a, at the time. So I actually haven't. Um, yet done justice to Puerto Rico and the territories and the insular cases at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, there are cases called uh, uh, Balzac and Dor and others. Um, I hope to do so in actually a book that I'm just starting this summer. It's going to take me three or four years to, to write. There are different ways of slicing the story. We can do it textually. We can do it geographically. Um, we can do it chronologically. And this new book um, is going to actually tell you the story of the Constitution from 1761 to 2000, 20 years at a time, with a tip of the hat to Lincoln. It's called 12 score, um, rather than 4 score. Uh, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1761 to 2000, from the Revolution to Reaganization, to the era of Ronald Reagan. Um, and there was no issue more important in America at the beginning of the 20th century than the status of our territories, whether, quote, the Constitution followed the flag. Um, this was a, of interest to Lincoln. Remember, the Civil War is triggered by um, the stat certain rules about um, the territories, and, and Dred Scott actually has some stuff about the territories. But the truth is, I've actually done some research on women in the 14th Amendment or the original understanding of the Bill of Rights or religious freedom. I haven't st uh, studied enough of the, the story of the insular cases, and so I don't want to give you a glib answer. So um, there is great stuff out there, um, and if you come up afterwards, I'll give you a couple of books that you might want to read that have been written or edited by others. But I, I'm not enough of an expert to answer your very thoughtful question. Well, on that note, which I don't know that I've uh, ever seen, which is the uh, Professor Marsh uh, stumped and, and uh, by a question, I think we'll uh, I think we'll call it a night. Uh, and I just want to end by reiterating to thank everyone from the audience. I'm sorry we didn't get everyone's questions answered, but thanks again so much for coming out on a stormy night. Uh, Thanks to the archives for hosting us. And thanks for Professor Amar for his enthusiasm, his scholarship, and for uh, writing the great books he does, whether you agree with everything he says or not. I think we can all agree that he is an unbelievably infectious speaker who, who uh, just in, should inspire us all about the greatness of this country um, and the greatness of our Constitution. And with that, uh, good night.